Let us pray. Father in heaven, we pray that you will give us clarity of mind so that we can truly understand your word as we seek for revival at such a time as this. Amen. Now, if you've been uh, following the 10 days of prayer, which I'm sure you have been, uh, you will know that we are, we've been talking about seeking revival. Now, if I were to ask you, what does the word revival mean? I am sure that you will tell me that something or perhaps someone needs to be renewed or restored. And of course, if we relate to our Christian lives, we can say that for the child of God, revival is a fresh inflow of life and love and power of God in our lives. There's a question I want to, to, to pose. And the question is, do you feel a need for revival? in your life. And I just want us to, to think about that for a moment. And I must say that the hymn that we started with, planting one's feet on higher ground is such an appropriate one, especially in the time in which we're living. We, 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 we are being engulfed by this very ugly virus. And if ever a time we need to plant our feet on higher ground in the safety of Jesus Christ, it is now. If ever a time we need to be revived, it is now. Now, last summer I went shopping and I, I must confess that I don't like shopping. I just don't like it. I do it because I have to. However, I went shopping last summer one day and I bought myself a mini rose in a pot and a peace lily in a pot. Now, a sharp eyed onlooker might have wondered, why on earth would you want to buy something like that? Two plants that are faded and drooping. Do you know something? In the same way, as Christians, we have periods of drooping in our lives. There are times when we can become faint and wary. And you know, we lose energy and we lose momentum. Now, if you'd like to turn with me to Psalm 85, verse 6, and uh, the, the psalmist David uh, makes a very important observation here. So Psalm 85, verse 6. And he says, he asks the question, will you not revive us again that your people may rejoice in you? It would seem then that uh, here David was actually, he saw the need for revival and he's confessing a need. In the same way, you and I should feel a need for revival and also to confess that need. And the question is, you know, how about us? Are we fading the same question and drooping and need to be revived again. And so David is asking the question, will you revive us again? Now, where my plants were concerned, I saw the need in those two plants. All they needed was some water. And we will continue with this analogy a little bit later, because if you and I want to be revived, we must seek revival. And I think this has been the, 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 the thread throughout the, the, the past four days uh, in, in what we're, we've been talking about in terms of the 10 days of prayer. Uh, first of all, you and I must express our need to be revived and also admit the possibility of revival. Because in verse four of Psalm 85, uh, David expresses, Restore us again, God or Savior, and put away your displeasure toward us. So here we are. Will you not revive us again? 
And from what I gather, from what David is saying here, God had obviously revived in the past and would do so again. So if you and I are feeling a little bit, we've lost momentum, we're fading a little bit, we are reminded here by David that God who had revived them in the past can also revive us in our day. And the next thing we need to do is to admit to ourselves that God is the only source of revival. Revival cannot come from us, as David admits in the psalm. Now, as I was thinking about revival, as I, I read the reading for today, uh, I went back in my mind to two notable examples in history. And these two examples grabbed my attention in, in such a way that I feel that I need to share it with you. And I'm sure that you know uh, what I'll be talking about. So let's just journey back in time. The year is 1857. In fact, the period is 1857 to 1859. Now, this period should be titled the event of the century because a revival swept the USA in such a way. It began quietly and unexpectedly, and it profoundly affected both sides of the Atlantic, restoring conviction of sin, recovering heartfelt praise, filling churches, transforming public morality, and raising a new generation of Christian workers and missionaries. What a time that was. And as I focused on, 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 on that uh, revival, I thought about our time in our country, in terms of what's happening now, each of us need a revival. Now, why did this revival take place in the United States? It was the time of the depression of the US, in the USA. The autumn of 1857 was signaled by a sudden and fearful convulsion of the commercial world, similar to what we're seeing now in the pandemic in, in our country and indeed in the rest of the world. Thousands lost their jobs and their livelihood. Businesses folded up. Men's hearts were failing them for fear. Never was there such a commercial crisis so inexplicable under the laws of trade. Things were so bad that people began to feel, and in fact, some acknowledged that it to be the judgment upon mankind. And I'm sure there are people who are possibly thinking the same way now in, in this corona uh, uh, pandemic. Now, this depression led to a revival which commenced with one man. And for me, that is significant because if we are going to see a revival in our lives and in our church and in our country, the revival has to begin with me and it has to begin with, with you. So one man in New York, at that particular period of time in time, felt the need for a revival. And so what did he do? In the upper lecture room of the old Dutch church on Fulton Street, New York, a solitary man was kneeling on the cold floor. Can you imagine it? This man was engaged in earnest, importunate prayer. He prayed for God's leading. He prayed for God's intervention in the situation. And another question I want to ask us, when we have crises in our lives, is that what we do? Do we go to God first? Now, something amazing happened. This man, every noon, noon time, he began to pray. He was praying all the time. And, and then later on, uh, others began to join him, resulting in a prior meeting at noon with businessmen um, stopping their business, whatever they were doing. And then 
the numbers began to increase so much that this became known as the Noonday Businessmen Prayer Meeting. This prayer meeting was well and truly inaugurated. Soon, prayer meetings began to spread like wildfire across, the, across New York and the USA. Churches everywhere were opening their doors for noon prayer meeting. And what a revival that was. I wish to God that we could have a similar thing in our country at this time in, which we're in, uh, in what we're going through. God, you see, began to move on the hearts of men, and as prayers were answered, the spectacle of such universal confidence in God was without parallel. Never before in modern times were there such asking in prayer, such believing in prayer, never such answers to prayer. A whole nation was completely transformed because one man started to pray for a revival. Another question I want to ask and to, for you to contemplate. Will you begin to pray for a revival today? In fact, in the book of Chronicles, it is said that if only my people would stop to pray, then I will heal their land. That was what happened back there in the depression in the United States centuries ago. We're still on this historical journey. So fast forward now to 1904. We meet a, a young man called Evan Roberts, a young man deeply devoted to the word of God. Here was a young man who never left his home without his Bible. And through prayer, he began to seek the Lord for a revival in Wales. Now, this young man, this young man was so devoted to prayer that God would wake him up at one o'clock in the morning, for example, and he would pray until daybreak. And so as he began to pray for a revival in Wales, the Lord heard his prayer and he answered. And all over the country, testimonies of hardened souls receiving salvation and changed lives were the talk of the town. In fact, stories of profanity silenced. It was said that the horses that used to take the miners to the mine, they got a bit confused. They didn't know what was happening because they were so used to being prodded along, you know, kicked and swore at. And now the miners were behaving in a completely strange way as far as these horses were concerned, I'm sure. But that was, the, that was what was happening in Wales at the time. Theatres were, were deserted, courts abandoned because there was no crime. Can you imagine something like that happening in our day? The pubs were shutting down. They weren't shutting down because of COVID. They were shutting down because people in Wales felt the need for God in their lives, not for entertainment, because the football matches simply could not compete with the presence of this glorious visitation of God on the country of Wales. The sales of beer and alcohol declined steeply, while pocket New Testaments were snapped up like hot cross buns as people hungered for the bread of life and the true living water. I gave my droopy faded plants water and they came alive. But the people of Wales and of the United States had received the living water the spirit of God. Now, the revival in Wales, it was just so exciting because um, it seized not just a group of people, but a whole nation. In so much so that the Western Mail in Cardiff actually published revival editions. You know, how often does one see religious news take front page of a national and secular newspaper. Can you imagine um, 
this news in the Times or the Guardian or the Independent. Now, in Wales, in these editions, religious news actually superseded current affairs. Can you imagine that? Such was the power of the revival in Wales and the revival in the United States. So then, how do you and I put revival into practice? First, you and I must have a sense of our need. We must sense the need for revival and express that need. We should also, like David, admit the possibility of revival. Now is the time to be revived and put revival into practice. In fact, E.G. White uh, says that revival, true revival, is our greatest need. In the book, True Revival, page 19, she says, the spirit and power of God will be poured out upon, the, upon his children. But it is the responsibility of his children to seek this gift. She further states, a revival of true godliness among us is the greatest and most urgent of all our needs. To seek this should be our first work. There must be earnest effort to obtain the blessing of the Lord, not because God is not willing to bestow his blessing upon us, but because we are unprepared to receive it. And then she says that our Heavenly Father is more willing to give us his Holy Spirit to them that ask him than our earthly parents to give good gifts to his children. That is what God wants to do for you and I. It therefore means that it's not just about praying during the 10 days of prayer and then go back to perhaps praying once or twice a day. The Bible tells us and Paul tells us that we should be praying all the time. We must not stop praying. It doesn't mean, I'm sure, I know you, you know this, um, it doesn't mean that we should you know, be kneeling down every few minutes um, praying. No, praying without ceasing, that we're always praying in our minds. We are working, we're studying, but we are praying to God. We must pray more and talk less. Iniquity abounds. And the people must be taught not to be satisfied with a form of godliness without the power and spirit of God. I don't know about you, but I feel that the time is ripe for a revival among God's people. Do you know, I can sense, and I don't know, can, can you feel that we are, we are on the brink of, uh, we, in fact, 2020 showed us quite clearly that we are living in the last days. Christ is soon to come. There are only a few signs that are left to be fulfilled. And God's people cannot afford to become complacent. We cannot remain in our complacency any longer. You know, I, I'm starting with a couple, and uh, in my church, we we uh, we've been having uh, on on a, on a given Sabbath uh, morning uh, and afternoon, we have well over a thousand people on uh, YouTube uh, listening, tuning into our services, and on live stream, well over that amount every week, and we have found that th there is hardly a Sabbath that in the eldership, we don't get um, a text or two saying, please, I have heard your service today. I would like Bible studies. I would like to be baptized. Last week, we had about three or four. 
and it was uh, about a couple of months ago, I had a text from a couple saying, we have watched your service and we would like to start Bible studies. So I'm actually studying with a couple and I, I spoke to them a few days ago and I said, well, how did you actually find us? And they said, well, we've been to several churches. We came upon your church online and we, we loved what we saw. And, um, and the young man said to me, he said, when I saw the pandemic and what was happening, I was reminded of how my grandmother brought me up. I had left the Lord, but when I, when I see what's happening now, I just feel the need for revival in my heart. I need to come back to the Lord. And so it is. I feel that the time for revival, and I'm sure you will agree with me, is ripe. The time for revival among God's people is now. We have become complacent and very Laodicean in our attitude towards spiritual things. And indeed, uh, John the Revelator in chapter three of Revelation talks about the Laodicean state. And so we need to move from that state because uh, as the writer says in, 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 in today's reading that often our Christian lives are not as effective as they should be. And this doesn't mean our church programs and outreach plans are in vain. No, because God blesses every effort that we do. But the writer says, the Lord has surely blessed as far as possible our sincere human efforts. But how much greater could our experience be if we received the full outpouring of the Holy Spirit? Only God knows the possibilities. And we saw the possibilities back there in, in the US. We saw the possibilities in Wales. And God knows that if every one of us, all of us begin, allow God to revive us again, we will have such a revival in this country that perhaps would have outwitted Wales and America. If we seek revival, it will happen. However, we seem to have a problem, the writer is saying. What might this be? Is it spiritual? Could our lack of Holy Spirit lie at the root of our lukewarm Christian experience? Is that why we're fading? Is that why we're drooping? If the answer is yes, then why do we lack the Holy Spirit in our lives? Because it is only through the Holy Spirit that that, that revival will take place in my life and, and your life. James has the answer, and we read this for scripture reading. He provides the answer. He says, you do not have because you do not ask. And what he's saying here is that you and I, we have to ask for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit in our lives. He says, you ask and you do not receive because you ask amiss that you spend, you may spend it on pleasure. In Wednesday's reading, we learned that God invites us to continually ask for the Holy Spirit in our lives. So what James is saying here, if you and I don't ask for the Holy Spirit in our lives, we're going to be crippled. We, you know, we, we, we're going to be useless, as it were. And Sister White says, why do we not hunger and thirst for the, uh, for the gift of the Holy Spirit, since this is the means by which you are to receive power? Why do we not talk of it, pray for it, preach concerning it? When was the last time you heard a sermon on the baptism of the Holy Spirit? When was the last time you spoke about it in Sabbath school or any other um, uh, forums for discussion? But that's what E.G. White is saying in Testimonies for the Church, volume 8, page 22. Why do we not talk of it? Pray for it. So therefore, I am thinking then that to put revival into practice, we must be filled or we must be baptized by the Holy Spirit. Look at what happened at Pentecost. Let's just um, quickly go to Acts chapter two. And it's a story that we know very well, but what a powerful and remarkable story of revival amongst God's people. 
Jesus Christ had, um, had promised. He said, look, I have to go back. I have to go back home. My, my, my work is now finished, but I will. I will send the Holy Spirit. I will send him to you, but you have to do something about it. And the Bible tells me in chapter uh, two of Acts, when the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Do you see that? They, a small group of disciples, they were together in one place. And they were not just sitting around, you know, having tea and having a good time. Because Jesus has said to them that you have to come together and pray for the infilling of the Holy Spirit. And the Bible tells us suddenly in verse two, a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They, in verse three, they saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. What a revival took place at Pentecost. What a revival. They took the world by storm. Once they had been revived, once they had received the power of the Holy Spirit in their lives, they took the world by storm. A revival began that very day. And the Bible tells us, does it not, that Peter got up to preach. I reckon he might have preached for about 10 minutes, who knows. And 3,000 souls were baptized. Praise God, 3,000 souls. Now, we have campaigns. I'm sure your churches had campaigns and nothing wrong with them. Had campaigns. We've had a two-week campaign. And how many people are baptized? You know, two, three, four, six. And we are happy. Indeed, we're happy. But how much more God would do for us if we were baptized with the Holy Spirit, if we were revived, if we put revival into practice? Now, do you want to be revived and put revival into practice? If we do want to put revival into practice, perhaps... What we should be doing is that we must stop asking amiss. Perhaps James means that God cannot bless us when our minds are set on things of the flesh. And Paul explains this. He says, for to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Romans 8, 5 and 6. So the question is really, do you and I want to be revived? Do we want to put revival into practice? Then we must, tap, we must stop asking amiss. We must say, Lord Jesus, I've come to realize that I am fading. I am drooping like the, like the peace plant, like the mini rose. And Father, I know that it is the water of your Holy Spirit, the living water that can revive me so that I can go forward and do the work that you have asked me to do. So therefore, in conclusion, I can say therefore that in order for you and I to experience revival and practice it, we must employ the means for securing revival. And the secret of revival is prayer, praying for the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Now in Christ Object Lessons, page 139, E.G. White says, daily he received a fresh baptism of the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> and we see that, don't we? We know in scriptures that Jesus, <clears throat> In the, in, the, in the early hours of the morning, the Bible tells us that he would go out and he would pray to God. He, if Jesus Christ needed a daily infilling of the Holy Spirit, how about you and I? You and I need a fresh infilling of the Holy Spirit. And Jesus Christ longs to anoint you and I with his spirit 
in preparation for each day and also in preparation for his soon return to draw others to you, to him, to draw others close to him and for us to be drawn closer to him in preparation for his soon return. <clears throat> my brothers and my sisters, the time is now. The time has come for you and I to ask for the revival. Like Evan Roberts, we need to, to pray and ask God to fill us with the spirit. Because Sister White says, just before the coming of our Lord, there will be such a revival. There will be such a revival. And my question is, do you want to be part of that revival? I want to be part of that revival because the Bible tells us that the harvest is ripe and there are only a few reapers. And like Isaiah, let us pray and say, God, send me. So all of us need to pray that God, like what he did for Isaiah, the seraphim put that coal upon his lips and he was revived in the power of the Holy Spirit. And I'll end with that question again. Do you want to be revived? May God bless us as we contemplate on these words and pray as never before that God will revive us and that we can put this revival into practice because soon and very soon, he that will come will come and will not tarry. Amen. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for your words. Your words are clear that all we need to do is to confess that we need to be revived, that we have a need for revival. So Father, revive us today, revive us in your spirit so that we will become beacons of light in our community and that others, their souls dying, they're perishing every day through Corona and every other uh, ways as well. Father, we pray that we will go out and warn the world and tell them that you're soon to come. Revive us again. Revive us again, we pray in your name. Amen.